was amazing. I mean, they the were government. So. Yeah, but you haven't seen it. Secretary Dynas, you heard most of the conversation. Did anything stand out? I agree that prevention is, is a, an important part of putting an end to child abuse. And our, our goal in protective services is to uh, put ourselves out of a job. But it's a challenge, you know. It is so deeply rooted in so many different aspects. It's a very dynamic uh, condition of society. It has many facets and there, there needs to be many different approaches to intervene. So you guys had a report in, I think, 2010. You said child endangerment had gone up 35% in the last two years. Mm -hmm. Why? I can't say that there is an increase in child abuse. I think there is an increase in reporting, in awareness, because the reality is um, we can't knock on a door if we're not aware of a situation occurring. Okay, given what we all talked about, can I get some, some feedback on that from our, from our community folks? Because you keep telling me this is 100% preventable. Absolutely. It is. And we know where the risks lie. Right. Okay. And we know who the parents are who present the risks to young kids. And so really helping that to rise. Now we, we also totally all support primary prevention as well, universal home visitation, fabulous. Absolutely. But the very, very essence of connecting the dots in our existing system is essential. You're representing the Children's Cabinet as well as yes. Children's Youth and Family Department. What's happening with that? I haven't seen a report since 2011. It's, so. it's getting ready to come out. Okay. We're, we're trying to pull together all of the cabinet secretaries that have any potential for uh, providing services to families. This year we're covering uh, education. We're covering zero to three. Uh, my area is, is safety in it and prevention. And then uh, nutrition. The goal is to do exactly what you're talking about. Connect those dots. Make sure that we are talking to each other, removing those silo walls, really talking about who the system's for. The figures that uh, Dr. Miller brought up, 135 million for child protective services, three million on home visiting. Is there a way to flip that? <laughs> is this all Children, Youth, and Families Department money? Is this other Not state? as far as I know. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, I'm still, can you, can you speak a little bit to that, Jared? Absolutely, we, I, I think our, I run the Protective Services Division, which is the, basically the child welfare agency for the state. We have programs that are not child welfare focused, but connect to the service like domestic violence and others. Um, but our, our total budget for all of those services is 125 million. Uh, how much of that is sort of prevention focused, Jared? Can you, do you well, know? Is our it agency is not a prevention okay. agency. We have a small amount of federal dollars that help us with prevention, which really helped us to implement the new reporting number, pound safe, from a cell phone or one eight five five three 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 safe. And what is that? Safe. Can you tell tell us well, what that, that is? That's a that's our hotline number that is answered by trained caseworkers that screen the reports that people give um, around their concerns or, or suspicions of child abuse or neglect. It's been really helpful to be able to get. Uh, that reporting process much more simple. Um, that the the limited prevention money that we get in protective services helps helped us to do that. What happens when you get those? Are you interfacing with people like Sergeant Weber or State absolutely Police or? All, all of the above? We have family members, teachers, therapists, school social workers, law enforcement, neighbors. You know, anybody, any adult in New Mexico is a mandated reporter. If there's a suspicion of child abuse or neglect, they must report. Picking up on what Jared is saying, what do you all think of that as a system for getting at what we've talked about? Getting the whole community engaged? I think we have a community of people that are ready, willing, and able, but don't know how. Um, and, and the other thing I would like to say before anything is that social workers go out and do investigations on every case that's reported through this hotline, but about half of them will be substantiated. Is that correct? We actually, uh, we, we screen the reports and I would say it's about 50-50 whether or not we investigate and then, oh. and then it's about 25% statewide are substantiated. Are, are substantiated. And so there are three quarters of those calls that come in that somebody had a concern about that's right. that don't go anywhere. Hmm. So 
those are the very dots that need to be connected. Well, what are you saying, Angie, that they weren't substantiated, but it doesn't mean something bad's not happening? Right. Exactly. Right. Exactly. What, what does that's it mean exactly to substantiate it? To substantiate an investigation of child maltreatment, which could be abuse or neglect, we have to have some evidence, some indication that a child, that something really did happen to cause this incident to happen. One of the things that wasn't mentioned earlier that I think is really important to bring up is that there's a bigger issue than child abuse and it's child maltreatment. It includes child neglect. What does that look like? Child neglect is leaving children alone, which we see chronically across our state. It's um, being, children being exposed to drugs or, or alcohol. It's them not being fed appropriately, um, failure to thrive, children not you know, infants or toddlers that are not being cared for appropriately, not getting medical attention, um, living in filthy homes, and and going to school with un, uh, with dirty clothes. But you're, that's a range of things, and I could see some of that being malicious, and some of that being people who really don't have a lot of resources. So. That's very true. We we don't want to criminalize poverty. No, that's not our intent. But that's why we want to give people some support. Now, it doesn't mean financial support, but it means connecting them somewhere that can help them with housing, that can help them with with all of the other things that need to come in. I don't know how many contracts CYFD, for instance, and DOH has with providers in the state. Department of Health. Mm -hmm. Tons. Uh -huh. And the Department of Education and the Corrections Department. I mean, there are lots of contractors. Uh -huh. Lots. Are they trained in child abuse prevention and seeing it? That there hasn't been that consciousness right now. Having requirements in every contract that says CYFD referrals need to be an absolute priority and having requirements that every call that comes in should get a connector. There's so many resources we have, but they don't have to do it all. You know, our funding is for intervention. It's not for prevention. And when I travel around the state and I talk in communities, I talk about how in order for this to happen, we have to have communities step up. Services that we now put in the category of home visiting and, and um, universal health care and, and those kinds of things, once upon a time were done by communities, those neighborhoods and neighbors. And that's really part of what I see as the only true way of us being able to address that because we as a government agency can only do so much. Are you saying it would take a, the legislature or something to change the mandate for you to do more prevention or is it a matter of? I don't think that, the, that that's necessarily the case. I think that we need to share the responsibility. Madam Secretary, uh, how is it that someone like our organization could join your organization and how could we work together? to prevent child abuse? I think that, well, I know that we're meeting with uh, Dr. Ornelas and Dr. Strickler next week, because we're also talking about uh, the CART system. And, right. and the what is that? I'm sorry. It's the, child child abuse, abuse. the child abuse response team, the services that Dr. Ornelas and I provide to see children at the tertiary prevention level, children who are already victims of abuse or suspected victims of abuse. And I think an important point that has come up in this discussion that people really struggle with is how we uh, how we look at child abuse in terms of different levels of prevention. Right. And, and mm -hmm. one of the things I struggle with as the clinician who's on the severe end of the spectrum is the, the, the thought from society and from, from my peers that the work that I do is not prevention. The work that I do is prevention. And I think the work that I do is one of the most important aspects of prevention because if Dr. Arnalis and I are unable uh, to do our jobs and, and assess uh, abuse that's occurring, those are the children that are going to die. Uh, those are the children that are going to cost the most money to care for. Uh, and, and it's very difficult to, to be a part of a very small subspecialty in medicine um, and be basically clinically overloaded with the volume of patients that we need to, to care for on the severe end of the, the spectrum. In, in my ideal world, primary prevention services wouldn't stem from protective services and wouldn't stem from child maltreatment clinical services because the reality of the situation is we're the stigmatized group. We are the group that people don't want to see and I respect that. So um, who, should, where, who should it be? I think Dr. The, the wealth of other community providers that, that are represented here. 
there are a number of other resource providers who really need to step up. So medical, you know, primary care providers, as we oh, talked right. about, yes. um, the school system in terms of educating young people, um, mental health, social service providers. Hey, I, care providers. Yeah. Yes. Everybody. 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 And, and truth of the matter is, folks, animals were protected before children were. Mm -hmm. And I think everyone here knows that. And unfortunately, by law. <laughs> And even by society, acknowledging the importance for the need for protection. The first um, child abuse laws came from laws that were in place that protected animals. That's how they prosecuted the first cases of child abuse on the books, was wow. using <coughs> animal protection laws. Exactly. And it was and less than 100 years ago. Yes. And to put it in a, you know, a global historic perspective, mm -hmm. we have only, as a, as a world, as a society, begun to talk about child maltreatment in the last 100, yeah. even 50 years. Yeah. You know, the battered child syndrome was coined in the mid 70s, mm -hmm. so it's really only been what, 35 years. We have years. a lawmaker here. Mm -hmm. What is the appetite in the legislature? I know we've had a tough budget years, but um, mm -hmm. the data on early childhood development is pretty strong. Yeah. Do they see this as an economic development issue in kids? And well, I see it as that, but you know, it's hard to convince some of my colleagues what uh, early childhood development means and what it is. Well, it has some it of your, I know some of your legislation's mm -hmm. focused on yes. increasing penalties. Exactly. Well, do you, can I ask you all, I mean, is that is that effective? And I'm going to go for another enhanced penalty. You want penalty. more penalties. Okay, but is that the way to go? It's a means of tertiary well, prevention. It means only <laughs> because if someone is behind bars, they don't have access to a child to harm them mm -hmm. in any way. I, I think certainly that's not the ideal uh, means of prevention for anyone sitting in this room, but is it in some way effective? Mm -hmm. I suppose, you know, yes, it would be. Even would be <clears throat> for pre prevention um, is uh, go to the prison and then start training there and then to the parole officers mm -hmm. and training there because you training can't, people who are incarcerated yes yes who are who were the the perpetrators they need to be trained as well otherwise they're going to go out and do it again they have been cut. doing that for years we started that yes, in 1988 you did. yes mm -hmm. you did and those you lost funding. no longer yes. exist one you thing I'm, I'm worried about we come out of this is that you know you're telling me your mandate is intervention so I'm afraid we're all going to say this, and we're not saying who should be leading this. <laughs> what I'm hearing from this conversation is our, our legislature needs to step up and recognize we need to form a whole new oversight organization for welfare of children before abuse and before maltreatment happens. And is that, a, is that the means to connect the dots? Well, I don't I, know. I think we have some places. We have an early childhood learning council, yes. and the charge is really to create a seamless system for young children. And we know that young children are the ones at greatest risk for child fatality. Mm -hmm. And so we can have a conversation about how perhaps they can serve to create the policy and the place where calls can come in to connect children to systems that already exist. I don't think that the creation of another entity is really what's going to fix it. I think the, the entities are out there. It's just that we need to identify who is willing to step. I, I think the Early Learning Advisory Council is an, an excellent point of contact. Reality is we've got to engage schools because my experience as a therapist as well as someone who's worked with teenage girls who had a teenage girl pregnant in my home my, my son's, the mother of my son's daughter, who said, I'm finally gonna have someone to love me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we have to look at that as another aspect of what leads to child abuse, is these young girls having babies, intentionally having babies. It doesn't matter, you can teach them all about contraception. They're not interested. They want to have a baby. Finally, someone that's going to give back to them what they haven't been able to get from anywhere else. Is this something that's particular to New Mexico, or do you think this is nationwide? Oh, I think it's nationwide. Okay. I, I think that's, we that's part. We, have a very, we do have a high teen yes, pregnancy yes, rate. Yes, absolutely. Yes. But, but that is part of the issue is that, yes, we need to start with that baby at the center. But I think that as, as a long-term view of things, we need to get 
back to even before that baby got created. Mm -hmm. So that when that baby gets created, it comes into an environment that can provide what that baby needs. The, the other thing that I think is, is so important, and I think you've, several people have touched on this here, is that we also need to invite into the early childhood realm and into this uh, realm of talking about children the unusual suspects. We don't, for example, I don't think, we don't have anyone from the faith community here, and uh, the faith community is very uh, uh, involved in the lives of families. Um, in New Mexico, we have a, a pretty high military presence. The military is talking now about the fact that uh, their volunteers aren't prepared. They don't have the education and the background and uh, the lack of criminal so records. How do you connect and those, all it, those disparate groups? We have to start thinking a little bit outside of the box and saying, who needs to be part of these conversations? We, we clearly have all said we all need to be part of the conversation. We all need to know in our communities about children at risk. Uh, we need to recognize that there are opportunities to give children a great start in life, but um, we have to make sure everybody's included. Dr. Miller, do you want to take on that role? <laughs> I would With love to group. take on that role. Okay. I really would. I think everything that you said is right. And I know um, for CAP, uh, New Mexico CAP, we are working really hard at um, opening up lines of communication with all of these different groups. Uh, we're trying to have the dialogues in the communities around the state too, to listen <clears throat> more than to speak because we need to hear what people need and it may not be what we think it is. Is there something that the legislature should be considering in the next session around? I'm looking at one person that's missing in this whole debate and that's a perpetrator. Mm -hmm. That's the sex offender. Mm -hmm. That's the stalker mm -hmm. that goes specifically to certain areas where children are out. He's not in this conversation. How common is that versus people who are perpetrating within families? You are seeing, who, is there any typical person who's a child abuser? My experience is that anyone could abuse a child, at least physically. Now, sexually, that's a different conversation, but certainly there are risk factors that, that uh, have been addressed that should be looked at. Uh, I would say that family violence, uh, uh, meaning the uh, abuser of the child, the child actually has a connection to that abuser in some way, mm -hmm. is far more common than your pedophile who's hanging out at the park. Not that those people don't exist, because they do, and they are very dangerous and they need to be dealt with. Uh, but I think for purposes of our discussion here, what we're really talking about is the family. This is one reason I wonder why this doesn't get discussed, because the ugly secret is this often happens in families. I'd like to That's say that I think young women um, who are in relationship with men, uh, often are in relationship with men, they know that the man isn't the, the safest person to be with, but I think there's really a financial issue. This is a very dangerous thing. I think what we do know is that it's the non-biological fathers mm -hmm. are often um, really dangerous uh, for young children. And we're also and seeing an increase of women. Yes. Who and are the perpetrators. Yes, really? we're also yes. seeing that. Mm -hmm. Oh. But we're really... That's, um, that's the unspoken. Really? No, that is very unspoken. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. You all have told me this is 100% preventable. How do we do that? How do we fund that? Three years ago, I was in Valencia County in a town hall with the members of the community after a horrific murder of a three-year-old boy. And I was sitting there talking to the, to the citizens of Valencia County and receiving their anger and their frustration and, and their outrage, and rightly so. Um, and they were frustrated with CYFD for not stopping this, for not preventing this. Unfortunately, you, we can't do it all, you know. I don't, I don't believe that funding is the, is the solution. Communities have to get engaged, families have to get engaged, neighbors have to get engaged, schools have to get engaged. Those things are already funded. Those things already exist. If the community will get involved and make this a priority and put their foot down, we're not going to tolerate this, we're going to protect our kids, we're going to stand up, things will start to change. Well, I, hear, I hear what you're saying, Jared, but isn't funding still? Well, an but, issue but in terms of an attitude change too. I think they what do. you're talking about is an attitude change. Children ought I to be the
priority, mm -hmm. ought to be the number exactly. one Exactly. Mm -hmm. I think funding needs funding to be needs held off. When the funding isn't there, and people are, are really forced to decide what is their priority, and then when we identify where the shortages are in funding, mm -hmm. then we go in and get more funding. And Secretary, let me tell you that Valencia County stepped up. They created mm -hmm. a child abuse mm -hmm. prevention task force, and this was community driven. We had one or two people from our office engaged in the task force, but it was community driven. The you know the leaders of the task force were community members, and we had family members from of this little boy who got <laughs> engaged, and they began to make a difference. When communities get engaged, things start to change. The previous governor prioritized domestic violence, and he created that commission, and he created a secretary level position. I don't know if that's the answer, but I mean, that certainly, I think for the people who work in domestic violence, changed the way they work. Mm -hmm. Increased funding somewhat, but I think it also forced them to examine where the funding was going, if that was the effective use of funding, things like that. I really like the idea of creating a roadmap. I really mm -hmm. do think it's right. great, and I really do think it's very important to put all heads together, and maybe mm -hmm. we do that in a memorial to really create then points of access. You think that's possible, Senator Garcia? It, it, there's umpteen memorials. There's many of them that have passed. They've gone nowhere. They're well, just memorials that say they have no. We need leadership, though. We need <laughs> we need champions who have visibility. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. we also live in a very media-centric world, mm -hmm. and the 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 bad cases get lots of attention. That case yes. in Valencia County drew some action. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be nice if we had action because these children need a great start in life, not because Before something bad happened yeah. to somebody. Okay, yeah. let's pretend we don't have any new money, which might be possible. <laughs> How is it 100% preventable that if we don't have this new money to create universal home visiting? We, we redirect our money yes. that we do have to make children our first priority. Mm -hmm. I like the idea of, of a memorial that allows us to explore how we identify, where we identify. Mm -hmm. The ELAC may be the ideal place to identify. ELAC? The Early Learning okay. Advisory mm -hmm. Council. Okay. Uh, as the, as the, the point of contact for creating these resources in communities. It's just a matter of, as Angie Vacho says, connecting the dots. Well, with that, I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, <laughs> thank you, thank you for nice. having this great conversation on Public Square. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you so much.